It was no secret that old George Underwood and Squire Holbrook didn't see eye to eye. After all, like most folks in Carter County, Kentucky, the Holbrook family had supported the Confederate side during the war. And those Underwoods, well, everybody knew that those scoundrels had conducted raids and stole many horses in support of the Union cause. And just because the war had ended, it didn't mean that folks just up and forgot where each family's allegiance lied. No. Old George couldn't forget that those Holbrooks were part of the army that burned his cabin down. He knew those filthy Holbrooks were really just rattlesnakes walking around in the flesh. In fact, you might say that there was a downright hatred between these two powerful families. And it was just a matter of time before the powder keg of animosity exploded. And when it finally ignited, no one could stop the violence. Not even the government. Because when hatred runs blood deep, there's nothing a man won't do to protect his family's name. Prepare yourself for Appalachia's deadliest feud. George Underwood was a Virginian by birth, and he received a land grant and moved his family to Kentucky in 1847. He was a devout Republican. He stood about six feet tall, raw-boned, and broad-shouldered, with a quick temper, and he was the type of man that would never back down from a fight. Heck, he had the scars to prove it too. During his lifetime, he had been shot at and wounded dozens of times. He had been shot in both legs, his right thigh, several parts of his body, his head and his neck, and he wore an eye patch because his left eye had been shot out. And these battle scars had left him walking with a slight limp, a bitter heart, and little patience for anyone who crossed him. He never traveled without his rifle or his two navy revolvers belted around his waist, always on the alert for any would-be enemy. Now during his lifetime, he married three times and he had many sons that would do his bidding for him. And just like their old man, these boys had well-known reputations as outlaws and fighters. In short, the Underwood clan was one you best not cross or there'd be hell to pay. Squire Holbrook he was also a Virginian by birthright. He made his way into Kentucky via a land grant in 1860. He was an intimidating and calculating man, a proud Southern Democrat. He quickly earned the respect of many of the prominent families in Carter County. One of his strongest allegiances was with a powerful Stamper family, and Squire had a large family known to take the law into their own hands. They viewed themselves as regulators, and they thought nothing of killing anyone who crossed them or their neighbors. The sheriff and even the governor made it a habit of simply looking the other way because even they knew there are some folks that are just better left alone. Now George Underwood, he didn't think too highly of these Holbrooks or their efforts to be the law in Carter County. Oh, they better not cross me or my kin, he figured. And the day they do, oh, they'll get more trouble than they can handle, he was reported to say. And so it was Two powerful families, the Underwoods and the Holbrooks, both with no fear of the law, and they both held true to the old ways of mountain justice, an eye for an eye, so to speak. And both these clans would somehow have to do the impossible, and that was stay out of each other's way. And well, like I said, it was impossible. And what happens next sent shockwaves throughout America and still haunts the hills and the hollers of Kentucky until this very day. The Underwood boys, all 16 of them, had grown up with the same reputation as their father. All of them were experts with firearms, skilled in every way, and reckless. It was only natural that they would have many enemies. Two of the youngest boys, Jesse and Alfred, had downright established themselves as horse-stealing renegades. 
The newspaper once printed that these two outlaws have probably stole more horses in Kentucky than 10 outlaws in Kansas ever could. Now Jesse, he was a slender fella, keen-eyed with a smoothly shaven face, except for a heavy dark mustache and long hair. He wore a black Prince Albert coat, dark blue pants tucked into his boots, a smooth starched white shirt, standing collar, and a neat black tie. He wore a soft slouch hat with the front rim turned down to shield his eyes. Buckled across his waist was a stout belt, and hanging from it were two heavy Colt Navy revolvers. He kept a Sharps rifle, always half cocked, and ready to confront any trouble. Simply put, he was a gunslinger, and he was known to kill a man too. Once, in 1868, a traveling circus had come to town, and this was a big event, with everyone coming from the hills and the ravines to witness it. Late in the evening, Jesse was full of that famous Kentucky bourbon. When a man made a wise crack about him, he said he had drank too much of that Jefferson Davis drink. Now that was a well-known insult, and although the Civil War was over, allegiances still ran deep. Jesse finished up his shot glass, and within a flash, he had pulled both pistols and shot the man twice, one between the eyes and the other straight through the heart. Despite the ruthlessness, like all mountain folk, the Underwoods took care of their kin, no matter what. And old George Underwood, he had 16 boys, a large family to say the least, but they stuck together, even when it came to their distant kin. Blood was blood, no matter what. In 1877, old George took in his nephew and rented him a small piece of land to farm on. Now his nephew, John, was a drifter and a noted gambler who had lost his fortune due to the powerful combination of whiskey and cards. As a result, he too had turned to stealing horses to supplement his income. Within a few weeks of John's arrival in Carter County, a prized stud horse was stolen from the powerful Stamper family. All eyes immediately turned on John, but they couldn't prove that he took his horse and he wasn't arrested. Oh, the Stampers, they weren't satisfied with that, and they demanded that the Underwoods kick him off their rented farm. But George, oh, he dismissed the warning. After all, blood was thicker than water. He couldn't turn his back on his young nephew, who had a sick wife. They had nowhere else to go. So old George just allowed him to stay with his son, Lewis. Twice more, the Stamper family issued warnings to the Underwoods to kick John out. And that made three times that the Underwoods paid him no mind. Furious, Squire Holbrook wasn't just going to stand by and see his good friends, the Stampers, taken advantage of by the scandalous Underwood clan. And in his mind, the time for words was over. It was time for action. Now, Squire knew that every Underwood was always locked and loaded, so the best way to carry out an attack on them was from the ambush. Squire issued orders to the Holbrook clan to kill every Underwood. The first attack came as one of the Underwood boys was sitting on his porch watching the sunset. He was shot in the leg, but he survived. His father, George Underwood, got the news and he saddled his horse to go visit him. But he too was attacked and shot six times, including through the eye. Somehow, the tough old man survived. Hell, he was just too mean to die. But the Holbrooks wasn't finished. A few days later, they returned to the site of the first attack, where they found the Underwood boy again sitting on his porch, this time resting on his cane from the first attack. Again, they shot him, but this time, right between the eyes, and they killed him dead. The next day, Lewis Underwood, on his way to his brother's funeral wake, was again ambushed by the Holbrook posse and shot with a 12-gauge shotgun right through the stomach. The bullet would leave him bedridden for the next two years until he died from the wound. As the war went on, the Underwood clan swore revenge for this brutal assault on their family. They first targeted the Stamper family, since they figured they were the ones that started all the trouble in the first place with the claim of the stolen horse. As the family worked in the tobacco fields, the Underwood surrounded the field, armed with rifles. And when the bullets started flying, two Stamper members were dead, two others injured, and all shot right in front of their children. Strangely, the law issued warrants for the Underwood clan's arrest, but not the Holbrooks. I mean, why would they? 
Since when the sheriff attempted to serve the arrest warrants, he was accompanied by the Holbrook Posse. Yet, when they arrived at the Underwood cabin, which had been built like a military fort, the Underwoods unleashed a hailstorm of bullets, driving the sheriff and his men off the property. By now, Carter County, Kentucky was an all-out war zone. No one was safe to travel anywhere. Both the Holbrooks and the Underwood armies rode up and down the mountain hollers in the backwoods. Attacks were always from the ambush. And the law, they couldn't stop them. Finally, the Kentucky governor called in the state militia to try and stop the violence. One night, the authorities cornered Jesse Underwood on his horse. They had him surrounded. Drop your guns, Jesse. It's all over, they shouted. The hell it is, Jesse replied with a defiant yell. The law unleashed a hailstorm of bullets. They hit Jesse several times. Unfazed, Jesse pulled his Colt revolver and shot one man straight through the heart, killing him instantly. Jesse was taken to jail, but he promptly escaped and was on the run again. In an effort to cut off the Underwood supplies, Squire Holbrook went to every business in the county, every store, shop owner, and merchant. Any man that does trading with the Underwood clan will face severe consequences. And I promise you, I'll burn down your house and your business and kill your children. That's right. The entire county was gripped in fear as news of the war spread like wildfire in newspapers all across America. Elvin was the only calm, clear-thinking person in the Underwood clan. He had tried to play the role of peacemaker with everybody involved. He never carried a gun, and he was a God-fearing man. He was known all over the community as a gentle soul. But this didn't matter to the Holbrooks, and they took no mercy on him. One day, as he worked his plow mule with his young daughters dropping seeds behind him, a single bullet ripped through the air, right through his skull, killing him right in front of his two daughters. A day later, Lewis Underwood, who had been lingering for two years from being shot by the Holbrooks, he died. Standing above their graves, old George and Jesse vowed to end the war. This is bad business, the old man spoke, to shoot an innocent man who'd never harmed a man, woman, or child in his life. That's right, Elvin never had anything to do with the trouble, and he always tried to keep the peace. Jesse added, then he paused for a moment, and then, Slapping the stock of his rifle with a clenched hand, he cried fiercely, But by God, they shall pay dearly for his death. Jesse's father shook his head in agreement, and with fire in his eyes and clenched teeth, he spoke, It's time to cut the head off the rattlesnake. Within days, Jesse had penetrated the Holbrook homestead and he waited patiently inside the hay barn for the leader of the Holbrook clan to exit his cabin. Just as the glow of the sun peeked over the ridges and the first rooster crowed, an old creaking door slowly opened as the man cautiously surveyed the farm for any unusual sounds or movement. His eyes gleamed over towards the hay barn, studying it for a moment. There was Jesse looking back at him, peering through the cracks in the boards. But the old man didn't see Jesse, and he slowly stepped forward on the porch. Fully exposed, Squire heard the distinctive sound that any mountain man instantly recognized. The cock of a rifle. And before he could even move, Jesse pulled the trigger. The leader of the Holbrook clan fell dead on his porch. Jesse quickly mounted his horse and made his escape. He had carried out his father's orders to cut the head off the rattlesnake. But if he thought he had ended the war, oh, nothing could have been further from the truth because what happened next is one of the most shocking acts in the history of Appalachia. The folks in Carter County, Kentucky, held their breath for what would come next. Like the quiet moments before a violent storm, they hid in their homes. At this point, Everybody had an opinion on which clan was right and which was wrong, but they would never let those words escape their lips, fearing that if they did, they'd be killed. 
The county judge ordered the sheriff to form a posse to stop the war between the outlaw clans. Yet, not one man volunteered. The governor ordered the Kentucky militia to return to Carter County and restore order. Yet, even the militia refused to return. The feud was heading for a final, bloody conclusion. And both clans vowed that the only way this war would ever end was once every member of the opposing clan was dead. George Underwood decided to wait out the Holbrook response in his fortified cabin. He had an arsenal of weapons stockpiled and a large supply of ammunition. He never once ventured outside his home without his pistols hanging at his side. And even when he did, he did so mostly under the cover of darkness. Early one morning, the coals had nearly died out in the fireplace. So he went to the yard to gather a few logs. Unknown to George, hidden at the edge of the woods, a posse of nearly 30 Holbrooks had the cabin surrounded on all sides. They waited until the old man's hands were full of logs. And suddenly, a man took aim and fired, <coughs> ripping the old man's shoulder apart. Suddenly, a barrage of bullets were unleashed. But somehow, the old man made it back inside the cabin. The posse fired on the cabin for hours. But the walls were made with 12-inch thick logs. The cabin had port holes located on all sides. And with George badly injured and being the only man in the house, the women and children each armed themselves with guns and fired back at the posse for days. On the seventh night, Jesse had made his way back to his father's home under the cover of darkness. But before he could enter the cabin, he was shot in a dog trot between the house and the kitchen. The women somehow managed to drag his body into the cabin. But he was mortally wounded, and he soon died. The women and children all cried and wailed openly. As the posse surrounding the cabin fired celebration bullets into the air. But the women, they kept fighting. By the tenth day, old George was in bad shape from the gunshot to the shoulder. Gang green had set in and Jesse's dead body was rotten inside of the cabin. The posse warned everyone that if a doctor attempted to enter the cabin to help the old man, the doctor would be killed on the spot. Likewise, if anyone tried to remove Jesse's body to bury it, they too would be killed. The Underwood women kept the Holbrook clan out of the cabin for 19 straight days. But the situation was getting desperate. The stench in the cabin that the women and the children were breathing was horrible, and they were out of food and water. On the 19th day, 30 men with their faces painted black to avoid recognition, armed with torches, demanded that the cabin door be opened or they would burn it down with the women and children inside. The women refused to open the door, but George negotiated with the men and they agreed to leave everyone unharmed if they could be allowed in to make sure Jesse was dead and George turned over all his guns. The women begged George not to, but he agreed to turn over all his guns. Within minutes, Fifteen of the men entered the cabin, while fifteen more surrounded it to make sure no one escaped. All of the men entered the door with guns cocked, and they stayed for an hour. George laid severely wounded in a cold sweat on the bed. The men gathered all his weapons, consisting of an old sword, six guns, three bowie knives, and several pistols. They pulled the sheet off of Jesse's dead body, and they all laughed and made crude jokes about the rotting corpse in front of the hungry, thirsty, crying women and children who had been locked in the darkness of the cabin for 19 days. Satisfied that Jesse was indeed dead, one of the men spoke. Old man, sit up and show us your wound. The grizzled old man, and veteran of dozens of gunshot wounds and countless battles, slowly found the strength to sit up on the side of the bed. And in that moment, the leader of the Holbrook men spoke up. Gentlemen, let's conclude this meeting. And then he pulled his pistol and shot George right through the chest as his body collapsed on top of his grandchild. 20 minutes later, George Underwood died and the brutal Holbrook-Underwood War was over.